Good evening, everyone. This is Shaitali Bagh from the European Bureau of Aviation and Defense Universe based out of Cyprus. The world today is witness to one of the biggest fear of war between two CIS nations with far spread global repercussions. Russia and Ukraine are on the brink of a conflict and are signature of all eyes. We have with us retired Lieutenant General Sanjay Kulkarni, former Chief of Staff 14 Corps, who retired as DG Infantry, Indian Army, to give us a comprehensive insight into the most important and continuously developing geopolitical story. So welcome to ADU's chat room. And now I hand over to editor ADU Sangeeta Saxena to steer the conversation ahead. Thank you very much, Atali. Welcome, General Kulkarni. Wonderful to have you at the chat show. And, uh, you know, it is something which, uh, you know, you are just the right man to tell us because uh, you as uh, DG infantry of such a big army have seen a lot of things which are happening in our very friendly neighborhood. And uh, sir, not no better than you to tell us about what is happening between these two countries, Russia and Ukraine, sir. Our audience would be very happy to know that. Uh, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. And as always, a pleasure talking to you. Uh, first, let me begin with to say that uh, Ukraine and uh, Russia seem to have a very old relationship. That's something which we all need to really understand because it's about almost 1200 years old and even uh, Putin has gone on record to say we are an old civilization, we are part of the same civilization. All having said and done, and it's surprisingly, and the best part of the entire thing is you have uh, Khrushchev and you have Brezhnev, both having Ukrainian blood in them. So that is the kind of closeness it is. But in 1991, finally, when uh, we had the uh, Soviet Union break up the 15 republics of all of them, Ukraine was the second largest, number one. Number two, one of those uh, republics which had tremendous potential from the point of view. Agriculture, industries, nuclear, uh, aircraft industry, you name it, and Ukraine had it. Now, Ukraine is almost a six lakh square kilometers of land. That is one. That is almost, you could say, uh, a little smaller than Afghanistan. That's the way I look at it. And population almost identical, which is about 41 million there uh, in Ukraine. We have almost the same kind of population that is there in Afghanistan also. But only difference being Ukrainians are Christians. So you have a Christian population in Ukraine. And Ukraine could be well divided into two, the Eastern and the Western. The Western Ukrainians are more leaning on to the West, that is the European, and the East leaning on towards Russia, because that has a sizable Russian-speaking population. So that's the way you look at Ukraine. And since it's a granary and a huge agriculture produce that is there, and uh, Soviet Union erstwhile depended a lot on Ukraine, we as India have excellent relations with Ukraine. We to have, today also, we have about 20,000 students and a lot into medical and a lot into software industry, uh, which are there working. So we have an excellent uh, old relationship with Ukraine. And we have, of course, uh, our traditional relationship with Russia has been excellent. So we are in a situation where we have very good relations with Ukraine and we have very good Russia uh, relations with Russia. So having said that, and you see the kind of Ukraine, after 1991, that's where the whole thing starts. Because after all, when the Soviet Union uh, broke and the, the republics, 15 of them, broke away from uh, the erstwhile Soviet Union, at that point of time, in Germany got united. And Gorbachev, and the thing was in, in his hand, he was promised that once the Soviet Union also disintegrates in the manner that it would be, NATO would not be allowed to come anywhere closer to the Eastern Europe and uh, uh, have any access to that side. NATO always had 12 countries which formed NATO. That promise is what Putin has been reminding people that you have gone back because it was very clear and Gorbachev and Helmut Kohl, then the German Chancellor, had an understanding that after the German reunification and the Soviet Union breakaway, they would not let NATO in any case come there. So the sphere of influence of the erstwhile Soviet Union, now the, man, the mantle with Russia, they would be able to handle it, the sphere of influence remaining without any effect. It didn't stay for too long. We find that in 1994, 
Hungary, Poland, and uh, Czechoslovakia become NATO members. And finally, again, a little later by 2004, you have Romania, Bulgaria, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, you know, Slovakia, Slovenia, all of these become joining NATO. Now, there was a lot of pressure on Ukraine also to join NATO. And Ukraine also, because as I said, the West Ukraine had more leaning towards Europe than it had towards Russia. Now, even Russia is part of the same thing, but they're more leaning towards the Western Europe, I would put it that way, and not towards the Russia. Now, despite all that, and it is supposedly the Russians had a president in Ukraine at that point of time who was leaning towards Russia. And therefore, it was all going hunky-dory. It's when the virtual civil war started in which the Russian the Ukrainian president was thrown. And in 2013, that is where the whole thing starts. And Ukrainians were now looking towards the European Union to become a part of it. But unfortunately, as it is, Ukraine is a very, very corrupt country. Internal uh, rifts and a corrupt country resulting in the way that things are in Ukraine. Russia wanting its influence to be there, the sphere of influence. Ukrainians looking that side. However, by 2014, the Russians annexed Crimea. As soon as it annexed Crimea, that is where the sanctions starts on Russia. So all that we see of it today is nothing that has emerged just about three months or four months back. Now you see how far back we've gone. 91, we've gone to 99, and we got down to 2004. And now 2014, the way it is. The Russians have been insisting that what we've been telling again and again, status quo ante. That means what developed in May of 1997, the same status quo ante should be there. That means NATO must pull out. And NATO means nothing but USA as they look at it, because that is the more power is USA in the entire thing. So they must pull out, which I don't think the USA would like to give in so easily of pulling out of those NATO countries which have joined. So now NATO from 12 have become a union of 30 countries. So North Atlantic Treaty Organization of 30 countries. Most of these are the East European countries which were erstwhile part of the uh, Soviet Union Empire. So the Russians obviously are very, very, uh, you know, uncomfortable with the NATO moving in slowly and suddenly. With the deployment of the air defense in these NATO countries, primarily Poland, you have Hungary and all these, that is where the problem now starts more with Russia. And the way the Ukrainians are getting in uh, a huge amount of military aid from USA, from the European Union also makes it difficult because then the Russians feel very, very uncomfortable that this, their sphere of influence is being threatened and therefore they wouldn't want Georgia or Ukraine to be part of NATO. Now that is where it stands as on today. Now in this process, the Russians also instigated an insurgency of the separatist movement in a region which was little, I would say, uh, north e east of Crimea called Donbass. Now, in that Donbass region where that uh, insurgency, which is more propped up by the Russians because there are more Russian-speaking people over there, though part of Ukraine, the sanctions on Russia started since 2014. The G8 became G7. So Russia was out, thrown out of that. And now again, sanctions on Russia, that the banks will not be able to go in for global sanctions, sanctions on Putin, his own extended family members, sanction on those. So all that kind of a thing that is happening around, which obviously Putin now decides to take a step. Now look at the international uh, uh, situation at this point of time. You saw the Neville chief of Germany giving a talk in which by the time he got back, he got sacked. Reason, he spoke something which from his heart that, well, Putin must be respected. He said, well, Crimea is not likely to fall back again. It has now gone into the right. It is China is a threat. What he really said was China is a threat and Russia must engage with the West and the Ukrainian crisis must be resolved through talks. So he saw as a German that yes, the threat is China, but if we start uh, pushing uh, Russia too much, then Russia would get closer to the Chinese uh, group and there would be Russia and China getting together, making it more difficult for others in that particular district. But Germans also had another, uh, I, I would say, an interest in this entire thing. 39% of the gas which goes from to Europe, 
Western Europe from Russia is the Russians are the supplier. Now, Russia is slowly and suddenly twisting that, letting the oil prices and the gas prices go up. The Nord Stream 2 pipeline, that's where the Germans have said, okay, the sanction is there, we will not use it. The Americans have said, we will not allow the Russians to supply. But 50% of the entire gas which is exported from Russia goes to Germany and Italy. So these are the people who are using it. Obviously, these countries are extremely cold. So not to get gas from Russia makes it difficult for them. Russia depends on revenue from the gas. And the West European countries depend on their gas for keeping themselves warm and heated up during the winter. Now, it's in such a cash 22 situation at a point of time when the Americans are wanting to show strength and deterrence so that their allies can stay with them. The Chinese are showing expansionism both in Ladakh and Taiwan in South China Sea. Here, the Russians are feeling cornered that the NATO is extending its arm and coming closer to Ukraine and Georgia. So, slowly, suddenly, as a part of all this, the Russians mobilized. Now, when the Russians mobilized almost a lack of troops with uh, uh, in regions like East, they went and have their they have almost 30,000 troops now in Belarus. Now, Belarus has all along been with Russia. They have not gone towards the Western Europe. They've been with Russia. So within their own territory, what the Russians are trying to say that, well, all this mobilization is in their own territory. They are not likely to uh, invade Ukraine. But, well, nothing, the West is not going to buy this story what the Russians are going to be talking about because they also have the intelligence sources and everybody has been saying the kind of mobilization that the Russians have done in terms of heavy equipment and also troops that have moved up almost a lack, that is virtually 70% of what is required in war. So if Russia was to really actually invade Ukraine, it wouldn't take them 48 hours also as the Ukraine would fall to Russia. So the Americans know. The Americans cannot involve themselves militarily into as far as this place. The Chinese are you know, looking back and seeing if things go bad, if they go bad, then the Chinese are free to do what they want to do in Taiwan. So the American assistance to Taiwan can't come because the Russians and the Americans would have got involved in, in this case. The European Union don't want Chinese to have their say go. So there's a cash 22 situation. So therefore, the need is felt that the whole thing should get resolved by talks. The Normandy group, that is France, Germany, Ukraine, Russia, the ceasefire that they have, the ceasefire was basically about Donbass to ensure that the separatists would not be there, the Russians will pull out, there will be elections and the partial autonomy would be given to that area. So the pressure of Donbass is on Ukraine. Russians are playing cleverly. They are not talking to Ukraine because they know it's no use talking to Ukraine because Ukraine is part of them, they feel. And if Ukraine is looking westward, then Ukraine can only be sorted out if West is sorted out. The West needs to be told that, look, you're stepping into Ukraine is a red line which we are not going to accept. Now, Putin also you know, I remember when I was in Japan in 2002, the Russian officer had come then in course. And uh, it was 2002, 1991, uh, the Soviet Union uh, had all these republics breaking away from them. You won't believe the Russian officer who was there on the course was drawing a salary of about $100, $110 per month. Can you imagine? When at that point of time, I was drawing about $400 per month. Of course, the Americans who were there on the course were drawing about $6,500. The Japanese who were doing course with me, my rank, and everybody was drawing $6,500. So that, but notwithstanding that, he was drawing only 100 and, and he was quite clear in his, when you say you were dressed up and all, one could make out that they were going through a rough time. That is the time when Putin takes over. And Putin has almost, you know, uh, transformed Russia from what it was to what it is. So today, Russia has a per capita income of going over $12,000. So that is the kind of... So Putin is seen as someone who has changed the face of Russia. Putin is seen as a man who's put back again Russia into the orbit as it was during Soviet Union time, as what it was known to be having power. Of course, it has a nuclear arsenal, much more than what the Americans have. But notwithstanding that, so Russia is back again to play a... A very, very strong and an important role in the world affairs. Now, Russia, though economically may not be as sound as it used to be earlier, with China taking up, if Russia and China again grouped together, that's where the whole situation and the difficulties with the Europeans are facing it. But the Russians have made it very clear, Ukraine or NATO, out. 
And not just that, they're also saying March or May of 1997 status quo. That means Hungary, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Slovenia, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, and Slovakia, and Slovenia, everywhere, wherever NATO has stepped in, they have to step out. That is the first. And in any case, uh, in Ukraine, no scope and no chance. If you enter Ukraine, you know that Russia will do what it wants to do. Russia is also not very interested in invading Ukraine because Ukraine is part of them. They also know that. But the pressure is there because Putin wants to make the Russians feel good and important that, yes, you count. You're not a riff-raff. It is not a world of USA and the Western Europe or the Chinese. Russians count. So that kind of a thing is very clear. India has an excellent relationship because you can well see Mr. Putin coming for a six-hour visit, traveling nine hours. He travels nine hours to come to Delhi to meet Mr. Modi and it has a, this thing, has almost 27 odd MOU signed, the AK-2045 billion dollars this thing is signed. So much so that that shows that the government of India and the government of Russia are absolutely in the personal relationship of our Prime Minister and the Putin is excellent. Otherwise, why would a man who has never stepped out other than once and this is the only second time in two years of COVID, he steps out to India he comes to Delhi, travels nine hours for a six hours meeting. So that is indicative that how much of importance Russians attach to India. And again, in the UN Security Council, the way the Indians have also abstained from voting is clearly indicated that yes, we want Russia who we, as our old friend, I mean, we respect and we hope the whole thing gets resolved because India definitely does not want that should Russia get involved, then you know what happened during the Cuban crisis in 62. The Mao Zedong took advantage of the Cuban crisis and did what he did. Here again, the Chinese would be looking for an opportunity right away because 2020, the whole Eastern Ladakh thing is started because of COVID. And they would be looking for an opportunity that since the Russians are involved, Russians are supposedly very dear friends of the Indians, the Americans are also very close to India, but all of them are involved in, in somewhere else. If this is the right time to do what it wants to do, a misadventure, be it in India or be it in Taiwan or anywhere else. So this is a situation which is now uh, a situation which is we need to really watch. We really need to be very careful about and we need to really monitor. And India has a very, very important role because the oil prices jack up because what it was uh, $75 a barrel jacks up to about $100 a barrel. So that is something which affects everybody the uh, world over. We see that we have we are 60% dependent on Russia for all our equipment, be it personal rifles to tanks, to uh, BMPs, to AD regiment, to uh, ships and submarines, to the aircraft carrier, to the aircraft, to the SUS and to the MiGs. So there's a tremendous amount of Russia in India and tremendous amount of goodwill that exists between India and Russia. With the Chinese unable to do anything because of this relationship. So you find the Chinese also can't push as hard as they want to do it because of the cash 22 situation. Firstly, because the strength of the Indian army has grown over the years, all of it, quite a bit of it, 60% of it dependent on the Russian equipment. Then the S-400. Now the S-400 that has come in in which the Americans want to apply Katsa, they can't possibly because that is for countering American adversaries. India is not an adversary. So they can't probably put castles on India. So they are also in a cash 22 situation. They know that India, in any case, S-400 has started arriving in India. So it's a very, very difficult situation. But hopefully, as we see even from what uh, the French uh, president after his visit to with uh, Putin has also said that the Russians are keen to come out of Belarus after the end of this month. Hopefully, when the exercise is over, they're not keen to invade Ukraine. But notwithstanding that they're not to do one, two, three, but they're also wanting that NATO must not extend and make Ukraine its member, must not step in with kind of uh, military equipment, you know, troops that are being uh, put into Ukraine that must be avoided. And in any case, Crimea seems to be totally in the grip of uh, the Russians because obviously from the Black Sea, they're wanting to uh, route to the Mediterranean. So they're not going to allow that to happen. So that is going to be there. Donbass and uh, the area of Crimea, obviously, though connected to the sea, but it would they would must want to have a land connection between Crimea and Donbas region. So there's a they would be looking at it that how they can uh, do it. They would pressurize Ukraine as much as they can to ensure that it remains within the Russian sphere of influence. Georgia also in the same manner. So there's a lot 
that is happening there at this point of time but notwithstanding all that i don't see as i my personal uh, that i don't see that there is a war which will uh, erupt so soon because the russians also would want to be resolved peacefully the americans are not in a situation to put in maximum 10000 or 15000 after what has happened in afghanistan they are not going to do again unnecessarily step into uh, though part of nato to step into ukraine to fight with russia they, that they wouldn't want to do the european union itself is so much dependent on the russian gas that they wouldn't want to do anything so drastic that their own gas supplies get cut off so it's all uh, each one wanting to exert himself each one wanting to show that they, they count and that at no point of time is now an ego in which the russians would not want them to come to ukraine ukraine much that it wanted wants to go to the west west europe wouldn't allow be allowed to go there so they remain within the russian influence and all of it remain but yes the russian uh, demand of a status quo ante of 1997 in which now that the nato members are 30 to revert back to 12 probably that may not be acceptable because all along uh, for all these years from 1999 to 2004 to uh, the latest been the i think the macedonia the 2020 have become member of the nato so it is not possible i don't visualize look but definitely the west will ensure that they do not do anything uh, which they cross the red line in ukraine and in georgia in belarus in any case it's a russian this thing so they do they also have uh, kind of arrangements within with pakistan where things went wrong and how the russians quickly moved in and ensured that the whole thing was settled peacefully so there is a lot that the russians are wanting to show to the world that they are not defunct as what the world might want to look at russia as having not been the erstwhile soviet union empire russia counts russia will count and i have said my my personal what i saw of the russian colonel when i met him in uh, japan in 2002 to what he was then and to what russia is today i think the credit goes obviously to mr putin to have taken russia to such a great height that you have a good per capita income account what matters is the inability of russia to be erstwhile soviet union obviously draws them closer to china because chinese depend so much on military technology and military uh, you, you know kind of hardware that come virtually uh, a copy uh, things of the erstwhile uh, soviet union now russia so in that kind of a situation but expansionism of chinese must be uh, seen to it i won't call it expansionism of those russians because this is russia is only looking at its sphere of influence they don't want anybody knocking at their door because it would be virtually once you are in ukraine and you know in georgia with latvia estonia uh, all of these uh, countries almost having nato troops then it would virtually you know uh, it would be virtually impossible for russia because that is why the i think the admiral from the german uh, navy was very right when he said that we have to respect uh, the and uh, take care of the russian interest because russia obviously feels uncomfortable with the nato coming so close uh, to them and that there was when the warsaw pact was dissolved there was an understanding that the nato wouldn't come knocking at the doors of the erstwhile uh, soviet republic but that has been violated clearly they are all there almost coming on to ukraine so that is where the russians are insisting that red line not to be crossed and therefore the russians are very clear i don't see a uh, invasion but yes there will be uh, uh, it will be a sort of a catch 22 situation where each one will jockeying around because uh, right now ukraine from uh, you can say from the e from the north they are obviously there in belarus from the east they are already there in donbas from the south they are already there in crimea so you find that ukraine is three pincer movements are ready with a lack of troops mobilized and kept in place so should ukraine be wanting to do anything even before the west can react or retaliate the i think 48 hours can be given max to uh, russia to capture uh, ukraine if that be so but it would lead to tremendous amount of bloodshed not less than 50 or 1000 people will die because already in donba uh, region about 14000 have already died since the uh, 2014 separatist movement has started over there so with this uh, kind of a thing i think uh, we as uh, a nation as india we have to be uh, praying that the whole thing gets resolved with talks 
and peacefully, and that uh, we continue to have good relations with Ukraine and Russia, and we don't allow China to be sitting and enjoying and wanting to exploit that uh, situation because that would mean the Indo-Pacific would almost get diluted because Americans then would get diverted more towards this region to handle Russia, which the world doesn't want it. So that is where it stays today. Yeah. Right, sir. I mean, that was wonderful. You know, I really didn't want to interrupt you. And you've actually given a beautiful picture of the complete thing. My query is one now that, uh, you know, if it's such a situation uh, in a friendly and not so far away country, how does it leave, uh, you know, Afghanistan, which is under Taliban, uh, Pakistan, which is always uh, under, you know, uh, for India, always under a very heavy this thing, and uh, also leaves Iran. You know, there, there, there's a, it's a very big, uh, you know, set of friendly nations. So uh, what happens when the world is all looking towards Russia and Ukraine? What is happening to, to these three countries? Is it affecting them? Is it giving them too much of independence? Now nobody's looking at us. So we are our own bosses. So uh, it has it, is it going to affect these countries in their activities? See what uh, Russia and China have just about given a statement that the sanctions imposed here on, on Myanmar or Korea and all these are, do not as yet have a UN uh, Security Council backup. It's a unilateral sanctions imposed, which has left most of these uh, countries in a very dire situation. Definitely, I would put it this way that all these countries, because Pakistan, which is now uh, got its strategic depth in Afghanistan, but then the Taliban is not playing the, to the tune of uh, the ISI much that they would have wanted Haqqani network to dominate in Afghanistan, that's not really working out because uh, all said and Pakhtuns are their own bosses. They don't believe. They are uh, tribal heads and each one of them have their own way of ruling. They are uh, Muslims by birth, but tribal by the, uh, you know, the way they are. So it's very difficult to control Pakhtuns and those Pakhtuns are in Pakistan also and Afghanistan also. So they are not. You know, the Chinese are definitely one of those nations which are looking at this kind of a situation because uh, a weak Pakistan uh, helps China. And Pakistan is a hate India uh, country which it, it thrives only on hate India and thrives on destabilizing India. So in that context, the Pakistani ego gets satisfied with the Chinese backing them up. Uh, economy which is totally ruined. You find Imran Khan, the, the kind of uh, treatment uh, he has been given in uh, Beijing, it self speaks that he couldn't even meet Xi Jinping and it, it had to be a virtual meeting with them. And he was hopeful that they would, he would get about three to five billion dollars of aid from China. So that also as yet has not come in. So much that he has said, very uh, this thing that, yes, we ensure that the CPEC, we will guarantee support and we will not let any Chinese get injured, hurt. But the Chinese are looking at it that our investments in uh, Pakistan, much that we are looking at $70 billion, nothing as yet has actually, they haven't got the returns as yet. And Pakistan slowly and steadily is getting in debt. So you find Pakistan destabilized. Afghanistan is not in a, uh, uh, it's in a situation which is always was dependent. 70% dependency of Afghanistan has been on external aid. So as long as America was there, they got what they wanted and they were quite happy to be there. The women were empowered. They saw so many, everybody was on mobile connectivity, a lot of freedom, a lot of education, a lot of development that took place. Afghanistan of what it was 25 years back into what you see Afghanistan today. You see a developed Kabul, not the kind of Kabul that one would have seen of Kabuli Wala days. So there's a tremendous difference between uh, American. The Americans have pulled out. Obviously, Americans have pulled out, leaving the entire thing. The Russians are not going to step in because one bitten, twice shy. They are not going to get into Afghanistan. So only Pakistan. Pakistan is absolutely bankrupt. So there is no way they can help the Durand line itself. Pakistan is not able to influence on the Durand line where the Taliban is just pushing them and saying that they are not going to fence it more than what they've already done. So the Durand line doesn't exist because all the openings and the route between Afghanistan and Pakistan where the Pakhtuns is free. So that is the situation over there. So with this kind of a thing where the minerals or, or uh, some of those, um, you know, uh, minerals of the Wakhan corridor and all of it, which the Chinese are in, which the Chinese, even if they invest a lot of money into it, even though those, 
that is all capital intensive investments. So that is not going to generate employment in Afghanistan. So Afghan is going to be in a situation where no employment. Chinese will take away the investment because obviously China is a country where if it invests one dollar, it will take back four dollars. So China is not going to invest money where, where it is one dollar is to one dollar. It's not possible. So that is very, very clear. So in this kind of a situation, what do we do? Because the, the, these countries are our neighbors. The China is our neighbor, Pakistan is our neighbor, Afghanistan, Myanmar, all these countries, Nepal, Sri Lanka, all these countries that are in and around us with whom Chinese are interacting and making them virtually their surrogate states slowly and steadily. Whatever it might be, the influence of Chinese is quite heavy. Even Bangladesh slowly and steadily is, you know, finding itself uh, because uh, exports from Bangladesh to any, any country are all Chinese. Basically, it is the Chinese industry, Chinese machinery, and there would be the manpower which is there. So all that is happening. I look at it that in this situation, self-reliance, what we've been talking about in matters of security for India, absolutely essential. Atma Nirbhar, what we talk about, America will be our friend, Russians will remain our buddy, Pakistan and China will, we will be their nightmare, and all our neighbors will be looking at us for assurance, insurance, and warranty that yes, there's a country like India, which seems Atmanirva, which seems confident, which seems doesn't depend on anybody, as has the ability to show eyes and hold its ground. I think that is what we need to do. We cannot, obviously, in the comprehensive national park, Chinese have gone miles ahead. We have, we have to give in to that. that. The Chinese have gone miles ahead. That's because they're an autocratic country where the communists only ruling. The population, which is 96% Han, have look alike, talk alike, one language, one food, one thinking, everything one. Whereas India is a democracy. We talk of unity and diversity. After every 50 kilometers, nobody seems to understand one another and nobody seems to even think alike. So in such a situation that we are in, and what a, a situation that China is in, the only way that we can really keep all these neighbors, because obviously countries like Nepal, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Myanmar, Afghanistan, even to a large extent Pakistan, where Pakistanis themselves are very close and feel more uh, as an affiliation and siblings of India. So once India becomes strong, India especially becomes Atmanirbhar and self-reliant in terms of security, is able to handle its territorial integrity and sovereignty with grace and with deterrence and uh, uh, ability to be able to give it back. I think that should be enough, but at least in this part of the world, because our relations with Russia must be made. We only, see, nobody can come and help India. And nobody, India must not even expect anybody who would come and help us. Our battle... Ah, this thing in India is ours. So when we are going to fight as part of the uh, armed forces, it is our fight. We, can, we cannot expect anyone to help us. If that be so, Atma Nirbhar in, in matter of security, economic prosperity will automatically come because we are a great nation. That is something which is very, very good about this nation. Is we really are a very hardworking and a great nation, irrespective of what people might talk about or we might not have confidence about ourselves. But we are a great nation with a lot of ability technologically, and ability to have a lots of startups, ability to adapt, ability to see that we can prosper ourselves in such a situation that we are in. Matters of security, Atmanirbhar Bharat will see us through great amount of crisis and there will be no crisis because a strong India is good for the world. Strong India is good for us. And obviously, we are going to be among the top five in terms of economy, in terms of armed forces, in terms of deterrence, in terms of missiles, in terms of nuclear power, in terms of cyber security, in terms of space, artificial intelligence. I think we are there. All we need to do is just gather our uh, you know, bits and ensure and Every Indian must be seen as a soldier, not just the soldier with a weapon or soldier. Every Indian or soldier, every Indian must feel that, yes, he is there, he can take on, and to him, his nation matters. You will find nothing can stop us. The world will look at us, and we are strong. The world will respect us. I look at it that way, because respect of the world lies in our hand, and what lies in our hand is our own strength that we are capable that's yes, idea. absolutely, sir. Absolutely. I mean, what you've said is absolutely true. And so lastly, my uh, last 
uh, thing which I want to understand from you is that, uh, you know, we abstained from the vote in United Nations. Uh, Russia is our friend, but so is the United States our friend. Now, have we balanced the tightrope well in this situation? Uh, that's something which I'd like to understand from an expert like you. Sir. I think yes. I think yes. Reason is that uh, first and foremost, as I said, our oh, excellent traditional relationship with Russia has absolutely yeah. been there right through. With Ukraine also, we, since we have a sizable number of student population there, plus the software technicians over there. With America, we have developed a new kind of relationship uh, after the way things have changed the world over after seeing what Chinese are doing and our own association as part of the Quad, our own multilateral uh, relationship with uh, USA. I think we balanced it very well. Much that uh, USA might, uh, you know, you might hear voices of cuts are coming up and, you know, uh, the, don't go towards uh, Russia, irrespective of that. USA understands India's need to be close to Russia. The USA understands that India's closeness with Russia will also keep China at bay, will also be able to handle China very well. And therefore, their need today is a China threat that the world needs to look at it. If the world needs to see Chinese threat, their wolf uh, diplomacy, their kind of, uh, you know, debt diplomacy that they work on, I think if Chinese have to be checked, if Chinese have to be shown their place, if China needs to be told that, look, if you step beyond this and if you start thinking you're center of the universe and you are wanting to rule the world and expect everybody else to be sitting down below and uh, become surrogate states to you, that's not possible. And that is not possible. I think uh, India so far has done an excellent job uh, and an excellent work because of this, maintaining excellent relationship with USA, excellent relationship with Russia and being able to check uh, China. Much that uh, trade with China, what we saw two years back into what we see the trade today, we've crossed $100 billion. What would possibly have taken a little longer, but then COVID uh, has, uh, you know, that trade with China has gone up because of the kind of international agreements we have signed. We are part of the, uh, you know, so many uh, agreements the world over that we can't much that we would not want to trade with China. I think now it's a dependent world. And in the dependent world, it's not possible to not to trade with anybody. And uh, we find that, yes, I would go with you. 100%. We are. And, the... uh, and sir, Russia and China together, uh, is, it, is it a happy sign for India? Well, uh, if we are maintaining very good relations with Russia, and even if Russia and China are close, even now they are close, I think uh, we are in a happy situation. I wouldn't say that we uh, get cornered. No, definitely not. We are, because there'll be enough uh, check and balance. That is why you found that uh, a lot of times, a uh, lot of meetings do take place in Russia where our foreign ministers have gone, uh, you know, defense ministers have gone, they've spoken over there. And uh, uh, things have moved. You find that at least we've reached up to the 14th round of the talks between India and China, the core commander level, to ensure that the peace and tranquility, tranquility prevails along uh, the LAC in Eastern Lada. So all this is, uh, obviously, there's a lot of pressure on China because China cannot unilaterally work because it would find itself in a catch 22 situation with Russia. And they know uh, that at a point of time when Russia and China were not seeing eye to eye, India and Russia were still dear friends. So, and we never had bad relations with America ever. We may be closer today, but to say that we had bad relations with America has never happened. We had excellent relations with America, whatever be it so. We, it may not be very trustworthy relations because of the kind of, uh, uh, you know, the NATO and the kind of CENTO and the CETO and everything. And with the, with the Pakistanis playing what they were game which the world has understood that Pakistan is uh, terrorism emanates from Pakistan, that Pakistan uses terrorism as an instrument of state policy, that Pakistan, the financial action task force has put Pakistan on the grey list, that Pakistan is economically shattered, the only export it does is terrorism. So they have understood. People, the world has realized that India is a, a country which is an old civilization, uh, runs by a rule of law. Here, things are much more uh, transparent. Democracy is very healthy, very vibrant. And media is a very strong pillar. Judiciary is very, very strong. You have all of these pillars which are independently acting are uh, check and balance in a country like this. And they can definitely trust India. Then they would trust any country in the world.
Yes, absolutely, sir. That, that was wonderful, sir. It was such a nice, wholesome discussion that I'm sure our audience will just love it. And, uh, you know, we will keep watching the stories developing. And uh, I'm sure uh, that uh, uh, we will expect positive results out of this story and out of our discussion. And I'm sure Chatali waiting there is sitting in Europe. And uh, she also has a lot of points, which I'm sure she's keeping intact for the next discussion, where she will, of course, we'll expect her to give us a feedback of what is happening there. She's sitting in a country which is, uh, you know, very, very active. You know, Cyprus also has gas and oil lines going to the rest of Europe. Cyprus also is a route for gas and oil lines coming from uh, the Middle East. So you have, you know, the Qatari lines are going through here to the other parts of Europe. So I think that will also be a very nice discussion one day when we sit down and when things are a little okay and Russia and Ukraine, uh, you know, have decided that, okay, now it's time to, you know, go back to our own positions. I think that would be wonderful. So thank you very much, sir. Lovely discussion. And we take you back to Chitali, who's waiting in the Cypress studios. Hi, Chitali. We are back now to you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you sir. Very. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much, ma'am. Actually, as ma'am said, yes. Uh, geopolitically, Cyprus is a very important place for uh, all this um, conflict that is going on. Not only that, in Cyprus, there's a there's a there's a lot of uh, Russians and Ukrainians both who live very peacefully here. I mean, they are friends to tell you, and I have a lot of friends. I'm sure uh, once this interview is out and your very comprehensive analysis that you have given to us, it's going to um, it's going to open up a lot of possibilities for them as well to, to look to the situation in a different way. Uh, the tensions are definitely building up, but still from a human interest point of view, from the human's point of view, they're still friends, you know? I mean, it's still good with people who are living out of, I mean, uh, Russians and Ukrainians who are living out of Russia and Ukraine. So I'm sure um, I just, I'm, I'm sure this interview is going to be a very good one for all of us. Thank you so much for this uh, time, sir. And Thank I hope you. to see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.